Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. I'm Chris Miller, the host of West Virginia Right Now with my co-host, Wes Thompson. And we are here with somebody that is very, very near and dear to my heart. Would everybody please welcome Nikki Thomas. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Nikki. Nikki has a very, very special story that I think is important for everybody to hear. And she has, um, just like many other people, um, dealt with adversity in her life. And the type of adversity she has dealt with has helped form who she is as a person today. And I will tell you this right now. I have yet to meet anybody in the Huntington area that lives a life of purpose and service for the community in the way that Nikki does. It is inspiring, it is impactful, and it matters. And so, Nikki, I'd like to turn the floor over to you and let you just tell everybody your story and so everyone can understand why and how we got here. Wow, that's a, a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, just very honored to be here. Uh, my story is what drives me today and my passion. I grew up in abuse and neglect. Uh, my father was a paranoid schizophrenic alcoholic, and uh, we lived over a bar. And I witnessed so much violence as a child. Um, I was molested at the age of five and by someone who was supposed to be caring for me. And I just lived a, just a life of horror uh, I would see my father try to kill my mother multiple times. It was like a daily occurrence. And as I got older, it got worse. So instead of going to school, I would be nursing my mother's wounds. I would be drugged out of bed by my father saying, you'll never amount to anything. And I would sit in a chair and he would literally berate me till the sun came up, telling me I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody. I have a scar on my face from my father. He was a brutal man, brutal. He got put in a mental institution. I ended up homeless on the streets at the age of 16. I was taken out of high school at the age of 15, uh, labeled a nobody and labeled a nothing. They said, J just take her out of high school because she'll never amount to anything. No, I mean, I never went to school. Nobody bothered to figure out why didn't I go to school, number one. What, where was I? Nobody cared. And I just fell through the cracks. So at the age of 16, I was homeless. And thank God, there was a school teacher that rescued me. She literally took me in and taught me how to get my GED. And so I'm in the city of Boston. I got my GED. I passed. And then I started going to junior college. And I realized I can get an A in college. I was so excited. And then from there, I got my associate's degree. Then I got my bachelor's degree. I became a, um, in teaching because I wanted to go into the schools and, and figure out why do these delinquent kids not show up for school? What's wrong? It's not that they don't have the gifts. It's not that they don't have the talent. They just don't have anybody that cares or they're out of their minds. And there's a reason why they're, they're doing what they do. Let, let's rewind back really sure. quickly and start with what happened, where that teacher found you, how that teacher found you, and the relationship that developed because of that. Because I think that is a very, very important thing to discuss is the impact that teachers can have in the lives of the children that they're blessed enough to teach. Well, and, and Chris, just to add to what you're saying, the thing that I was taking from it, which is very similar, is it, it was like this whole first chapter where every adult failed you. Mm -hmm. When you're a child, adults are the only thing you can look at. For yes. example, every adult failed you. And then you go on to tell this story of degree, associates, bachelors, right. move forward. I, I would like to know who were the adults then that didn't fail you? And it, was it teachers? Was it, you know, that's, that's I'm combining to Chris's question here. Right. Well, the system failed me. The family failed at the time. And, and, and there was a stranger that picked me up. Where were you? So I was in Boston. And I would just hang around the streets with bands, with, you know, Jay Giles band and all the people from there. Do you know that song, Love Stinks? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh. okay. But, but, but in Boston, just hanging around wherever I could stay with drug dealers. At the age of 15. Yeah, 16, turning 16. 16. With drug dealers. I worked at a racetrack as a groom. And I got, that, I got that job. I needed to eat. I needed a job. And they said, anybody need a groom? Come pick her up. And it was an old trainer that picked me up. And it, he wasn't perverted, thank God. But, I mean, 
you know, on a racetrack at the age of 16, you're in a very bad environment, the back stretches and all that. So, um, but this teacher took me in and she, she just noticed, she said, why aren't you going to school? You know, what, what? And she took me in and she started teaching me and she sat with me. She said, you're beautiful. She said, you're smart. She said, you can do these things. You can graduate. You can make something of yourself. That's what she said to me. And I grabbed onto it. I just, you know, like a sponge. And I believed that with all my heart. And then I began, you know, succeeding. And so many people today, they need encouragement, especially older kids, especially kids. They need encouragement, and they're lacking that. Wow. So let's go through um, what happened after that. So you literally found one adult Mm -hmm. that made a genuine connection with you. Yes. And inspired you to the point where you realized you could be better than what you were, better than what you were told, bypassing all of the years of trauma that you experienced as a child. Mm -hmm. So talk about that path. How'd that work out? What happened? Well, what happened was I I graduated from high school that way. And then I I was illegally a cocktail waitress. I'll just say it. I was I was making a lot of money as a college waitress. I was I paid for my own junior college, and downtown Boston. I don't think that's Boston. anything to be ashamed of. Well, I'm not ashamed. Yeah, it was in a club where the Celtics came in and all of that, and I lied about my age, and I learned how to. I learned all the drinks, and I was the biggest seller. You were surviving. I was surviving. I was the biggest seller. And I remember all the cocktail waitresses would have to make an hourly rate. And I made the rate. They would kid kid around. Nikki made the rate. But I would always have to act older than I was. And And I see that today even in my career and what I do for the girls' home is that the girls have to act older than they are because they were put in very adult situations. And they they can't be children. I mean, I couldn't be a child at 16. You know, my kids would say to me later on, let's go to home. I'm going to homecoming. I didn't even know what homecoming was. I didn't even know what that meant. I said, what's homecoming? I didn't know. You know, the things you're supposed to enjoy and do. But I'll tell you, it's either you sink or swim. You're a survivor. You, You do what you have to do. So moving through that in junior college, then you eventually went on to college as well, correct? Yes, I went. I got my associate's degree. I got accepted at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island, and I went there. How was that experience? Great. I, I were there, supported myself and went to school. Were there ever any circumstances or issues where you got two or three years in and realized, this is too hard for me, I want to quit? No. You just kept Never going, kept grinding. I grinded. I, I, you know, and I would there. I have to admit, and I was a waitress at night there at a at a because that's what I knew how to do. But I supported myself. But I was way ahead of what a normal freshman was. Sure, because I had been on my own, and these kids are acting stupid as freshmen. You know, they're they're just experiencing all this stuff, and I'm like. I feel like I was 30 years old compared to them, you know? So So you graduated from Johnson & Wales. Mm-hmm. What was your degree in? Uh, equine business management. No way. I'm serious. Which, so horses. Yeah. That's I fantastic. have a horse today. I adopted a racehorse. That's exciting. His name's Bernie, but he's not a socialist. <laughs> Is he a thoroughbred? He's a thoroughbred. Okay. So former, ra- former racehorse. Yes. Do you ever ride him? Oh, every day. Oh, that's awesome. I jump him. I'm, I'm teaching him how to jump. We grew up on horses. Um, you know, we had a bison farm and had several horses, have been through the training process of them, you know, the lunging, the riding. Yeah. I, I, I did that when I was younger. I absolutely love horses. There's uh, something really special about the connection between a horse and a rider that is, is just in, indescribable until you actually experience it yourself. I have a horse uh, for the girls' home as well. Oh, boy. His name's Clover. That's really therapeutic and, the and it really is. good. Oh, they make a connection. The girls make such a connection with the horse. They love it. That's the one neat thing about horses that they're empaths. They feel all of the energy and emotions yeah. from the people that they're around. Oh, my horse cries out to me every time I walk in. He loves me. I love him. And so do you live on the farm with no, the horse? No, no, okay. no. I board him. Got it. Okay. But he's a, a, he looks like secretariat. He's huge. 
I want to see him. He's huge okay. and he's amazing. So you graduate from Johnson and Wales. Mm-hmm. Then where do you wind up going? Then I ended up, I went to Florida with some friends, met my husband, and we got married and had a child. And I got my degree at Ohio University. So you came back up to Appalachia? Yes, I did. And then I didn't want to. Really? You had that happen? I did not want to. I'm just going to be honest. My husband's from the area, and I came kicking and screaming, and now he says, I cannot get you to leave, because I would never leave this area. I love it. People are so nice, genuinely. Mm -hmm. And when I first came to live here, I remember my car one time, I had a flat tire, and I put my window down like that much because somebody was coming up and knocking on my window. They really wanted to help me. And I'm like, you're not what used do you to want? That. You know, I'm like, what do you city, want? Yeah. I know. I'm like, what do you want? And he, Boston. And he looked at me like, are you crazy? You know what I mean? And I, I just, you know. So did he help you? I didn't let him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I bet you would now, though, knowing West Virginia. I would Virginia's. now. Yes. I love it. I love it. I love West Virginia. So you taught. How many years did you teach? I, I didn't teach. I never used it. Got it. Okay. I always, um, I wanted to stay home with my children. I made that a conscious decision because family was very important to me, and I did not want a broken home. So I made a decision to stay home with my children. Later on, I became a Christian in my life. Later on, all the dysfunction just... Did you, did you have up. any challenges parenting, knowing the childhood trauma that you went through? Yes. Let's talk about that. Um, I didn't know how to communicate. I had a lot of issues. My husband was a very loving man, and I had to learn how to be married because of all the trauma. And I made a lot of mistakes. I, I, and today, my husband and I do crisis marriage coaching. We coach um, couples in crisis because we've been through a lot of crises ourselves. But we help couples stay together. Talk. And The experience, though, being able to pay that forward, that's oh, incredibly admirable. And I'm very, very transparent. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've communicated poorly, but I've learned. You know, I've learned through, you know, God. Attrition, yeah. uh, Giving back. You know, um, who was it? Stephen Covey said, you teach once and learn twice. So every time we're in in a session with a couple, now we get the hardest cases, the ones that are, they're divorced or they're about ready to get divorced. Yeah, let's let's do that really quickly. Let's oh, okay. talk about We're what getting... you are doing now. Okay. So a lot. You have an incredible amount of things going on. Yes. And I feel like we're skipping from We're skipping. We're skipping from your role as a parent and developing into okay. a real mother. Right. And then career. Career. Let's talk about career. Okay. Let's but I want to go back to motherhood at some point. It's just to me so important considering her childhood to compare and contrast with her bringing up her own child. I am desperate to hear well, how then that Let's went. dig into that instead. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I mean, hey, we can go and then come back. I just want to well, make sure we don't leave today without hearing it. Okay. Well, my um, I'm humbled. I, I actually homeschooled for a year. I'll never do that again. Blah. Um, but I, you know, I my kids would probably say I've made a lot of mistakes because I didn't know how to communicate. You know, but I I learned and I humble myself and say, I'm sorry, I learned how to um, be better. Okay. Um, But I didn't know, I was very suspect of my husband's family because he had no, he said he had a good family and they were seemingly good. And I'm like, there has to be something wrong with this. Like I was always suspect of, that people can't, can't really, be yeah nice and normal. This is nice wrong. And, yeah, yeah, we're supposed to be yelling at each other and I know. abusing each we're other. We're supposed to be like brawling every day. So, I teach a lot of women how not to because if you're brought up in trauma and that kind of trauma, then you kind of create. Um, it's a part of the negative cycle well, that yeah. is perpetuated yeah. generation is. after generation. It is. Because as a child, it is. as the pathways in your brain are developing, yes. you're seeing nothing but abuse and belittlement right. from the people that you're supposed to look up to. Yes. So what you do is you create like a peace. I couldn't stand peace at, when, at the time, growing up when I was younger, married. I had to make... Uh, 
a tra- traumatic situation, like I would make a dramatic situation out of nothing because it felt normal. That's what was comfortable. It to felt you. normal, and so many couples go through this. That especially if uh, one spouse has grown up the way I did, and say domestic violence, which I re- later wrote my thesis on at Kentucky. Kentucky Christian University, I wrote a whole program for domestic violence. Which you went back and got another degree. Master's, yes. A master's degree. Mm -hmm. And so you have a master's degree Mm -hmm. in that. Yes. In going through this whole process, was there an aha moment for you in how you move forward to break the cycle, or was it just nothing but constant trial Um, and error and and consistent work? It was God. And when I gave my life to God, I, I found peace and um, a foundation that I could build on and a model that I could follow. So when you got your master's degree, Mm -hmm. what did you do next? I started promoting concerts and raising money for delinquent teenagers because they're my favorite, the ones that are vulnerable. And I started my career with a boy's home. Uh, and this boy's home was one step before prison, and they lived in an Amish country in Ohio, and I had to kind of bridge the community with them, and I did that, and I was very successful. And then uh, I learned how to raise money and write grants because I really wanted to provide what these kids needed. So then my pastor's wife, Jamie Lawrence, uh, said my, cousins has a, my cousin has a girl's home. That's about ready to close. And they are having problems. Located where? Golden Girl Group Home in Cerrito, West Virginia. And we serve the entire state of West Virginia, uh, celebrating our 40th anniversary. I've been there for 15 years as a development director. To me, that is the real, your real calling. Card. It is. It is. And let's talk about how you got that job, what mm-hmm. exactly Golden Girls does. Mm-hmm. And this is where I got to meet Nikki, by mm-hmm. the way, is her involvement and connection yes. to Golden Girls. You've been and, very generous to us. It, it, we all do our part. You do. Um, you mean what you say. You you live the life of l- giving. Thank you. You do. L- you l- don't might not want to hear that, but you need to. Thank you. Let, let, let's talk about how you got that job. Okay. And the move of the family there. Okay. And what you Woo. saw when you first got there. It was a challenge, and I'm a woman that's up to challenge, so I have to follow my No. Heart. No. Wow. <laughs> so um, I was very comfortable at the boys' home. I had raised a lot of resources. I could have stayed there and just, but I went to the girls' home, going to volunteer, and I met the girls, and they reminded me of me. I think there was one girl that was really feisty, and I'm like, oh. I this get is you. it. Yeah. This I get you. Yes. So I just gave the boys home a couple week notice, and I said, and I didn't know what to expect. I was going to save the girls' home. That was my mission. I was going to find a way to save the girls' home, and to save the girls. So let's talk about what what that organization does. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the the people, the the women that wind up there. Why do they okay. wind up there? Um, well, first of all. Golden Girl is not an old folks home and it's not a tanning bed. Somebody actually asked me, is it a tanning bed? So uh, 15 years ago, I had to kind of struggle with the name, but we had the name before the sitcom. <laughs> That's great. So and, and that doesn't pertain, but they're <clears throat> there. They're there from all over the state of West Virginia. And we they live in Cerrito, West Virginia, and they're taken out of their home due to severe sexual abuse and neglect. So these are girls that have cases in the state of West Virginia. Uh, They've either girls. been through severe, severe sexual neglect and abuse. Yes. Um, or trafficking. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you, trafficking in a form of selling your daughter to, for sex for drugs. We have a lot of that. Um, more horrific cases than I care to even... Wrap, you can't even wrap your head around. You can't. It, 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 th- these are very difficult things to talk about, but I really do want everybody out there yeah, to they, listen and yeah. hear and understand this. And right. I'd like to get into some of the some of the some of without with, without uh, violating the confidentiality of the girls that are no, there. You you I like to talk about some of the examples of some of the things that you've seen because I think it's very important for everybody out there listening and watching to understand that you know 
just because we uh, are privileged enough to live in a family that has stability, there is all kinds of horrible things going on in particular that have been created and magnified by the opiate, opiate epidemic yes. that has swept through Appalachia. And I think it starts there. Mm-hmm. It starts there. It does. It starts there. It starts there. And we have the daughters of the opioid epidemic. We have the daughters. So literally, there are girls that have been sold for sex for a pack of cigarettes for drugs, I mean, we're talking forced to have sex with somebody because for At what drugs. Age? Twelve. Twelve-year-old girls. Twelve. Twelve-year-old girls 12. that are the daughter of someone that they trust, and yeah. those people, because of their deep addictions, are selling their children for cigarettes and drugs. Yeah. So it's real. what happens when those girls wind up with you? What are the type of experiences you have to provide them, the counseling you have to provide them, and what, is, what, what are the, the measures that you use to turn them into a success? Well, that we have a clinical team, and we have a program director. We have an entire... I'm the development, which I provide them with everything they need. So I renovate all their houses, their buildings. I get them things that they need as girls because they need to be regular teenage girls. And we have to provide, you know, clothing. I want them to have nice clothes when they come to go to school because they go to public school. But we have a, a program that they follow. We have clinical counseling. We have group therapy. We have a respect program that was um, it was formulated by the program director, by the clinical team, um, that put together a program that the girls follow. Okay. Then I built an apartment complex for the girls when they turn eighteen. A, a beautiful apartment complex. How um, many units? It's eleven units. It's six um, six. Two, one bedroom and five two bedrooms with a community room, and it's br- practically brand new. It's a couple years old, but I, it was a passion of mine. That was a passion project. So when they because turn, of the falling through the cracks, yeah, when, when they, they turn, turn 18, eighteen, they are legal adults. You they literally can leave. have housing. Yeah, they can leave. Yes. you are providing sixteen girls yes. with the opportunity for housing to create that that stability yes. to move forward in the world. Yes. So instead of falling through the cracks, even if they say, okay. My mom said she changed, or my dad said, and they they don't usually. They say they've changed, but they don't. They usually get out of prison, and then the girl will find out, well, this does not work, or or they'll get hooked up with the wrong person, and they need to come back, which we have a girl right now that did that, so they have a place to come back in a beautiful apartment, and that's for them. And I literally... My husband said, I almost killed myself. I probably did. Building those things because I had to raise the funds to do it. I did it, but it's so phenomenal. So the the Golden Girls Group Home, how many girls under 18 do you house at any one time? 24. 24? Yeah. 24 24 Mm -hmm. girls from all around the the area that are placed with you Mm -hmm. for care, and you Mm -hmm. provide them with meals every single day. 24-7. 24-7. You get them back and forth mm-hmm. to school. Mm-hmm. You help them get their education. Mm-hmm. They become 18, year, 18 years old. They mm-hmm. are legally allowed to go do whatever they want to on their yeah. own after that. They are. You have housing for them after that that is situationary and a staging ground for them to then springboard off into the real world. Yes. How long do they stay in that home? As long as they have 40 hours a week of productive time. I like it. Yeah. So they have to have a they job have to or have a, a job. Civil, civic responsibility. Yes. They have to have a job or going to school. Got it. And or both. I also built a social enterprise. So last year, um, I built a brand new building that has a boutique in it where we teach the girls how to sell, how to do business. And so it's a safe environment where we have mentors there. And they literally... Work it. So they learn inventory. They learn how to set up showrooms for furnishings. They see a transformation. Like um, I have an artist friend who does uh, refurbishing of furniture, and she's an artist. So they see these pieces of trash furniture, and then they help revamp it, and then they sell it themselves. So what kind of success stories are you seeing through Amazing. This? Like I don't have time to tell all of them, but I will tell – Let's do a couple Please. at least. Let's do Please. it. Yes. Let's yes. do it. 
Let me have a sip of Starbucks. Right? While you're having a sip, I also mm. want to I, I want to bring in an observation <laughs> that I've got. Earlier, she was talking about in her marriage. You, you were saying that mm-hmm. you would. Creep. You really want to ask me about my marriage, don't no, you? Well, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of making mental notes as I we want go, you to. but I, I'm going to bring it to the current conversation. Do it. And that is, you said that it, earlier in the marriage that you would create trauma. Yes. You would create because that's what you were comfortable with. Uh, and I, it, and I was it, awful. And it sounds to me like awful. the what it's mani- manifested itself into. On a positive yeah. note, yes. is now rather than create trauma, you create challenges for positivity. Wow! So you now have replaced creating trauma, that. and you are now creating projects. Yes, things for you to put yourself into to struggle through to help get through. Yeah. I heard you off the air or off out of the, <laughs> off the podcast say there Uh-oh. was a, a, a project you were involved in, and you said I don't need to do that, but I wanted to. And it sounds to me Ooh. like you uh, you like to put yourself in a position to climb uphill. I do. And I, that is, I think, the positive replacement for what you were before. That is really... Is that is wow. that insightful? That's an insightful revelation. <laughs> what does that say about me, though? I really need a big challenge, but it's good. And um, that a, makes how, me feel really good. Thank no, you. No, that's a, that's a positive... Uh, yeah, it is. A positive thought. Thank I, you. I would add to the word purpose. Yeah. It's the purpose. It is. I mean... I, I've been married going on 20 years. This mm. coming May 28th will be my wife and I's 20 year wedding anniversary. Wow. And, you know, I've never been through the extent of trauma that you have been through or some of the other the other young ladies that are staying in your home have. Mm-hmm. And I'll be the first to tell you right now that marriage is hard. Oh. I mean, marriage is it's it, marriage takes constant work. It does. Marriage takes constant communication. It takes listening. It does. It takes compromise. It takes flexibility. It does. And at the end of the day, when Two people love each other more than they love themselves. Yes. That is the foundation and recipe for a successful marriage. It is. Because it starts there. It does. When you are serving, when I serve my husband with all my heart and he's serving me, we're serving each other. It's a beautiful thing. And I never thought I could have such a beautiful marriage as I do today. Oh, it takes work. Oh, it's we're we're together thirty five years, and we have three grandchildren, and it takes work, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And you know what's worth it is when we're used to save marriages, and I see the children, and I I have tears in my eyes thinking about a little girl. She was walking in with her her parents, and she looked back at me and said, "Thank you." She knew I helped their parents. She knew I helped her parents. That's awesome. And she said, with a big smile on her face and her big eyes, just, thank you. That was so amazing. That's fantastic. So amazing. So before that, we were talking about success stories at oh, the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hey, wait. We got back on track. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best, buddy. I'm a good co-host, man. You, you are. are the best. Shucks. Wow. Wow. Um, I'll say something stupid later. Trust me. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Why well, save all, it for we're, later? We're all friends. <laughs> we're all friends here. Sure. So uh, we have a girl that lived with us um, when she was 14, and we helped her get through uh, high school. And she actually got married. She's celebrating her 12th anniversary. I may be wrong. It may be a little longer than that. Uh, She got married in our courtyard at the girls' home. She now has three kids celebrating her 12th wedding anniversary. She works at the girls' home. That's fantastic. And she helps the girls in group therapy and all of that. And I got her a scholarship to Marshall University where she is getting her degree in social work. It just goes to show you how, while trauma can impact and be carried over generation to gener- generation, yes. so can paying it forward and making the difference in the life of somebody else. Yes. Because then it changes that cycle and leads to something that's very successful that then can be paid forward mm-hmm. generation to generation. Yes. And Chris, I can't help but draw the parallel between the individuals that we had the privilege of meeting at the recovery point who were part of their process mm. um, that were former clients of the mm-hmm. recovery point. That then are there now. Mentoring the people coming mentoring through. Mentoring the people that have been through the exact same experiences exactly. that they've been through. And you're looking at future you know, wives and mothers, and we need to break that cycle. I mean, I'm not a feminist at all. I'm not a feminist. But I, I like when my husband opens the door for me. 
Um, but I also believe in women empowerment. These girls need careers. Um, they need. My husband's not intimidated by me. Actually, he supports everything that I want to do. I'm doing a very large hotel revamp project, very large, and he supports me every step of the way and is not intimidated by me. But these girls need that because they don't. You don't want them to make the wrong choices. You want them to be whole first before they choose a mate. Absolutely. You know, a broken and, and, person and, marries a broken person. By the way, that's great advice for someone who did not grow up in trauma. Right. So for my own daughters. That's great. For my two daughters. Great advice great out there. Advice. Yeah, you have to be whole and empowered. And contrary and, to popular belief mm. nowadays, men and women are different. They are? We are totally different <laughs> at like the biological level, the hormone level. Yes. Our minds work You're differently. Different. The way that we communicate is different. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the challenge is it learning is. how to communicate with someone of the opposite sex that you've created this union with yeah. to make that end product greater than the sum of the parts. Right. And that's hard to do as well. And so imagine going through the particular levels of trauma that some of these girls have been through and how much more difficult that can be. It is difficult, and really, over the years, my husband kind of pulled out his, the hair in his head. He really didn't literally do that, but... Do they fall out naturally? He, uh, he's not bald. Oh, okay, well... No, he has thick hair. Nice. Which is amazing. Yeah. So, uh, especially after being married <laughs> to me for so long... Oh, quit it. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, and I run into a lot of men um, when we do our couple's uh, crisis, I call it coaching. We're not really therapists, but we coach them through problems, dark times. Uh, they don't know how to deal with their wives. Like the wives will go through all this abuse and neglect and trauma, and they just don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how to navigate, why is my wife acting this way? Well, I can then share why. And then how do you handle that? You don't handle that by running away. You handle that by loving her more. You have to love her more unconditionally. Well, and how many of the wives understand this? The wives are so relieved that they have somebody that understands. I oh, know that's what I mean, but yeah. coming into it, they probably don't know exactly no, what the no. best way to handle them is. No, no. And they, they just don't know how to navigate. They, they don't have a template. They don't have a template. What is a normal marriage like? So even if you have amazing communication, if you don't know what to tell your spouse... If you don't how can know, you, you how just, can you fix something if you don't know the right the rules right and and yeah the rules or or the foundation built on unconditional love is how you treat each other there's ways to communicate now I used to bring out every mistake my husband made in five minutes like I could just pull it out of my back pocket but I learned I was really good at cutting him down verbally and I'm ashamed of that. But um, I learned how to deal with the problem at hand. So the problem at hand, just whatever we're dealing with right now, that problem. And so we're going to solve this problem right now. You know, Rather like, than getting into an argument about something and then bringing in seven other things And I from do. The past. I, I was great at that. You made, I, a comment, I, you made a comment a minute ago that I'm still trying to wrap my head around because you said a normal marriage. And I still don't even hmm. know what that really looks like. Well, it's not as dysfunctional. As <laughs> I, I, I think that I there, guess there's levels of normal. I, I don't. I don't unique. know. Yeah. They're unique. I think unique that they're all unique. Good, they're unique. Well, but there's there what is you see on Facebook. Oh, there's what you yeah. see on yeah. Facebook yeah. versus yeah. what happens yeah. behind the wall. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Somebody well, throw me my phone so I can post something. You know, some facade about my own personal relationships. That's a great which idea. Which is not real. It's but, not at all. No. That's what's destroying a lot of people. But, you know, if you look behind the scenes about what was going on, if pe people need to start being transparent about what they're dealing with in their lives to set other people free because it's relieving to them. And then they need an encouragement, encouraging word from somebody, from an overcomer, so they can overcome themselves. We don't have enough of that in society. We don't have enough of people just laying it out there and saying, look, I, 
you know, I know I've done, I've done these things. It's not the way to go. I can show you a better way. And people are just, I don't know if they're ashamed or whatever, but be who you are, be who you are. It's okay. Now you can obviously don't want to lay everything out there in every situation, but I think people are longing for genuine people to stand up, stand up and be heard, stand up and make a difference. Get in there, you know, get in the fight. You're a fighter. Get in there. Get in the ring. You know, start start fighting for something good. Fight for something that's worthwhile. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for my wife. My husband it, would say the same exact thing. Period. <laughs> I, I, I no, was, he really would. I, I was faced my first year of marriage with choosing between drugs and alcohol and my wife. Mm -hmm. And she had to pull me out of a bar. Yeah. Um, April 1st of 2004. That's the last time I took a drink. Or wow. Yes, I can't drink either. Neither can my husband. My husband it was an alcoholic. He doesn't, he, he's not ashamed of that. But I mean, he was, he drank a lot and then I would drink and it would be, ooh, bad. Yep. Alcohol is the worst drug there is. It was for me. That, it, that it was my real demon. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I got um, mean like my father got. I did. It, it never, ever helped me become the person I had the potential to be. No. The, the, honest, the honest to God truth is, is that I wouldn't be who I am today without my wife. So do you, how do you deal with your social situations? It, it, like you're always in the middle of alcohol, I'm sure. All the time. So how do, you, me. It, it, how do you handle that? <laughs> it, was a, it was a process, right? I mean, I went through, I went through detox, which is real. Yeah, it is. Um, well, I my husband through, had two brothers die of alcohol. Uh, I, I went through... Probably two years of erratic sleep cycles. Yeah. And I kind of got hit with a little bit of manic energy that's also, it's always been a underlying part of me. Right. And without the alcohol in my system, mm -hmm. that kind of turned itself up. Mm -hmm. And so I had several, I would go through several nights without sleep before mm -hmm. I would finally crash. And mm -hmm. I went through about two years of that. And eventually you start hitting an equilibrium point. Mm -hmm. And once you hit that equilibrium point, and it's a battle every day. I remember, I remember washing my hands and smelling hand soap and having it remind me of gin, and it would make my mouth water. Mm, yeah. So you have to go through all of those things you as do. well. You do. And then you get to the point where you start stabilizing. Yeah. And it's all about mental control. At least it was for me. Mm -hmm. And to remind myself, today. Right. Make it through the day. Yeah. And then tomorrow it was today. Make it through the day. Mm -hmm. And the next day it was today. Make mm -hmm. it through the day. And then you start stabilizing yourself, and then you're able to start being around it. And I remember going to events with my wife. She quit drinking with me for two years, and wow. then she slowly started back again. Mm -hmm. But she did not have the same problems that I right. had. She, it, it did not steal her soul like it stole my soul. Mm -hmm. And so we would go to events and functions. I relate to that. And, and I would look at her and go, like, we have to leave. I, I can't be here anymore. Yeah. But then you have to know, mm -hmm. like, it, it, you have to know when it's... And, and part Call it, of, it calls your name. Yeah, it does. Part of it is it's the test to see how far you can go. And then you know, no, nope, got to go. Yeah. Time to, time to leave. Yeah. But you have to go through that. You have to build up to that point mm -hmm. in order to be able to handle it all of the time. Yeah. And eventually it was, uh, you know, one year led to two. Yeah. And then two year led to three. And then the next thing you know, it wasn't a problem. It didn't bother me at all. Right. And, you know, I, I can be in any social situation at any point in time right now. Yeah. And I absolutely know without a doubt that I will not break. I right. will not give in. I no. will not relapse. It's not an option. No, because you see yourself what you would be if you stayed that course. Yep. And if you do that, the damage. Yep. And and for me um, and my husband, I mean, I, I can't speak for him, but I know we don't drink because we. I can't. I cannot. I cannot. It's just a part of, um, I think, generationally, you have a low tolerance for it or and such a, um, it just and that activates something in you yeah, to where a, you're, you're, you know, just it energizes you to a point of it's. It's a lot of things. It's genetic mm -hmm. predisposition. Yes, it's, I have that. It's dealing with that. emotional trauma and the pathways yes. in the brain and yes. the behavior that's there. Mm -hmm. It's all of that. And, and I, I started I've, drinking at a young age. I mean, I and I was given, I remember as a child, given shots of brandy because I, like if I had a little cough or something, I'd be five years old and here's a shot of brandy. So I... <laughs> 
Uh, no, seriously. I, I, I know that that's it's stuff I mean, that we it's used to do as humans, right? Blackberry. Give the child some alcohol, <laughs> they'll stop coughing. <laughs> I mean, it, Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> it was blackberry brandy in a shot glass, and they would tell me to drink the whole thing, and I, I stopped coughing. <laughs> to be fair, have you had NyQuil recently? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> stuff is brutal. I mean, I, it, but it doesn't probably taste like blackberry I, brandy. No, I, I did put it in a snifter. Uh, <laughs> on <Ugh>. ice. <laughs> oh, no, Lord. it's strong, buddy. I tell you that. That's some weird dreams. Yeah. But, um, you know, girls, back to girls, they fall through the cracks uh, very easily. One of the questions that, that I had was, you said you had, you know, um, a, a number of beds currently. Mm -hmm. How many can't come in? Like, how many more beds could you fill? Well, we chose to be smaller and handle the worst sexual abuse cases there there are. and But now that we have the apartments, we can limit the waiting time. And then also there's a um, foster program within our program that we vet the foster parents so that we, they're in good families. A lot of our kids um, are in an average of 12 homes, 10 to 12 homes before they even come to us. A lot of them are abused in the foster care system. I know there are great foster parents out there, but for our girls. How, how overwhelmed is the foster care system and the um, uh, the home placement system in our area? Oh, I, I know in the state, the last statistics were 8,000 kids in the system. 8,000 kids in either the Children's Home Society of West Virginia or foster Just care. Just in foster care, yeah. So, and I that's mean, in a it's, state with 1.8 million people, and it's probably more than that because you talk about couch surfing kids. Yes. Um, oh, and, the unreported. Yeah, the unreported kids. You know, like I was, and so you're talking about older kids, like older girls that are. They look like adults. You know what I'm saying? They yes. look like adults, but they're not adults. They need to be children. Physically that is my, does not mean mentally. Right. Right. So they. And a lot of times they have to take care of their siblings. They have to take care of mom. They have to take care of whoever. And so, you know, we're talking about kind of like segue into trafficking. You know, you talk about sex trafficking, but there's also labor trafficking. You know, uh, people taking advantage of this under the table, kids working. You know, I remember working in a deli for like $50 a week and I would work like hours. Like, I mean... For fifty dollars a week, Wait. yeah, I, and and I think about it now. It's disgusting to actually. How can you even do that to a kid? Wow, I mean, I, I've had a job ever since I was ten and a half years old, but huh? I volunteered for that. Like I wasn't forced to. I wanted to go buy something, and I figured I had, I had to work to earn it. Well, the, what a concept, right? Yeah, imagine that. But yeah, and, and what's the other side of this coin? Because there's there's the um, there's the parent that is the addict that is selling their child for drugs, right? But then there is the demand. Where is the demand coming from? Well, the demand is from the sickos on the street that are perverts that are uh, preying on children, that they see a, a, an open door. Come on in. I need drugs, and here's my daughter. And these these are people that are also addicts, or I mean, any walk of life. I How mean, you 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 can point. You cannot point them out. You never. You don't know. These, these are, uh, and our girls, I have to say, uh, we have cases where they're abused in, in institutions like the church. Oh, wow. And so they, you try to tell them there's a loving God and they can't really relate to that. Oh, no, there's no way they can connect to no, that. No, they can't connect to that. Because everything that they have seen with that is, is perverted. Exactly. And it's disgusting. So of you have wolves and sheep's clothing everywhere. It's a real thing. Everywhere. Uh, of the 8,000 or so documented kids inside of the foster care system in West Virginia, how many of them are products of the opiate epidemic? I don't know those statistics, but I'd say they're, they're rather high, um, especially- 80%? Mm, and I think, well, I would say it, it's up toward that, but also you have to take uh, into consideration grandparents who are raising their grandchildren that aren't oh. documented in the system- Okay, 
So they're they're grandparenting. They're supposed to be grandparents, but they can't be. They're parents. As of 2019, I saw a statistic recently, and it mapped it out by county in the state mm-hmm. of West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Almost 50% of the kids under the age of 18 are being raised by grandparents. Yeah. And really? that, that, it, that alone in itself is a travesty. And it is very, very scary. And it leads to an entirely new set of problems that we are going to have to handle aside from recouping and recovering from the opiate epidemic. Mm-hmm. And Or a huge sh- uptick in suicides. It, 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 yes. Oh. And the yeah. fact that we shut down. Yeah, that's a whole it's other. big time. I mean, it's a, a, it's a other, massive uptick. That's a whole other issue. And we right also, there. we shut down school systems for an entire year uh. and lost an entire year of education. Mm. I mean, mm-hmm. an entire year. And then you think about all of these kids going through that pandemic whose only shot at getting two meals a day oh. comes from the school systems. And just think of the emotional trauma that they were in because the only alle- alleviation they have was going to, the, to school. Was going to school. That's yes. the only outlet of normalcy. And so we stuck them in that same environment oh. that is that toxic environment where the cycle continues to perpetuate itself as opposed mm. to getting them in. And just school. think there are people fighting still to close schools. What how ridiculous is that? I mean it, it, it is it is all the data it is, is asinine. It is closing down the school system for an entire year was it asinine. Is, it it is caused is more damage ridiculous. than anything that pandemic could ridiculous. have ever done. Ridiculous. That, yes. Yeah. Yes. Harmful. Disgusting. Harmful and selfish. Putting masks on children. Selfish, harmful, bad, ridiculous. I mean, we lost our minds with this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. And, and, and the sad part is, is that we did we it under did. the guys we were trying to protect and, you know, help an entire society. But when you really dug into it, there were only certain groups of people. And we knew this from the very beginning mm-hmm. that were going to be problematic mm-hmm. where it could, when infection could cause a life threatening issue. Right. And we should have just gone this particular category. You need to be really, really careful. Don't get out. This particular category. You need to be really, really careful. Don't go out. Right. Everything else we should have kept as usual. Well, and also the economy. I mean, you want to look at let's shut down everything prosperous in the country and let's then now cause a, a inflation with the market and all of that. But you're talking about businesses forced to shut down. You're forced to shut down. You're forced. Like to me, that... That just doesn't ring right to That's me. That's not very constitutional, if you ask me. No, it's not. And not only that, it's, you know, I, I feel like we found so many ways to destroy the fabric of our country through COVID. Let's see how we can destroy everything by using this as an apparatus. What do you think the end product is going to be of closing down an entire school system for a year, understanding the the issues that we're dealing with in the state of West Virginia, what is going to happen? Oh. What do you think happens with these kids? Well, not only, uh, you know, the girls at the girls' home are already two years behind in school because their parents are neglectful. So they come to us already behind. So now let's add another year onto that because parents aren't doing schoolwork with their children. And nobody can regulate that. So I think the long-term generational effects are detrimental, and we're, we're yet to see those. We're yet to see a lot of what the pandemic has caused because of research. I mean, we're not going to find out till late, much later on the true damage that has been caused. Bureaucrats. Whew. So let's talk more about <laughs> what you're doing with the Golden so. Girls Home and where that has led you when it comes to making an even greater impact in our community. Because I know what you're doing right now, and I'd love for you to share it with everybody else. You have some major development plans going yes. on. Yes. Well, yes. Um, Is that something you can share with everybody? Sure. Uh, we are intending to, to close this in November, uh, the end of November. I've been working on a volunteer project for five years. I created a team and I created a nonprofit organization called Cornerstone Community Development. And we took on the redevelopment of the 13-story Pritchard Hotel building in Huntington, West Virginia, which is 110,000 square feet. And what all have you done with that building that was dilapidated and in not very good shape? Well, it, right now it's dilapidated still, but I did make some major improvements. Um, what are the in plans? Okay. Well, 
first of all, I got the entire building remediated. I got a 500000 approximately $500,000 grant to remediate the whole thing, EPA. And then we went after historic tax credits, uh, state and federal, um, also bonds. We're doing a bond deal. So this is all interconnected uh, to raise $49 million. What is the project going to look like when it's completed, and what kind of impact is it going to make in our community? Well, um, it's going to house um, seniors 55 and older, and we're going to have 108 apartment units in there, and we're going to have research and state-of-the-art facilities um, supporting seniors. Fantastic. And and there'll be also rooms, apartments um, set aside for, like, youth aging out of foster care so maybe some of them can move in great. and have grandparents and, and talk about a great experience for them because they get to, <laughs> they get to connect and identify with a different generation of yeah. people that can provide mentorship for their lives. yes and there's great things happening in the state of west virginia um oh, yes, it, historic tax credits got raised 15 percent so you're looking at the state historic tax credit the capital stack in that building um could not have been done without historic tax credits because we got federal and state I also got a HUD-202 grant, which is 40 years of supplemental income. But 40 let, years, I'll be Let's discuss 97. that really quickly, because what we're talking about is you are providing world-class <clears throat> living facilities for senior citizens that are also going to have their rent partially paid for. Yes, subsidized. Subsidized. For 40 years. For 40 years. Well, yeah, 20 years, and then you renew it for another 20. So 20 plus 20 equals 40. Spectacular. Oh, so, well, so I'll tell you how I got that. At first, I got denied, and I said, let's put it in again. We've got to put it in again. Oh, so you're try. saying it was a challenge. It was. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm seeing a pattern here. <laughs> so um, we partnered with a Ford for-profit developer out of Lexington and uh, have been working with them for five solid years. And the head of that, the uh, CEO of that organization has done a billion dollars worth of development. And I've learned an awful lot over the past five years and so has my team. So I can only assume that you're gonna do it again. I would, I don't know what's in store for me, but I know I'm not gonna be bored. I see. I also <laughs> see an underlying trend. Uh oh, it's a trend. Yeah, I see an underlying. I'm gonna trend need more Starbucks. In yeah, well, drink. <laughs> in your life and the importance of foundation and family. It's important. Very important. Very important. More important to me now that I'm older. I'd say. Um, How old is your child? I have an oldest daughter that's 35, and then I've got a youngest son. I had three girls and then a boy who is 26, and uh, the boy was last, thank God. Sounds like I'm a sorry, separate conversation. I'm sorry, I love girls, but, I'm, but my son is just, you know. That is the way it goes, though, because I've got three kids. I've got two boys and a little girl. Aww. And I love my boys to death. You know, they're, they're grubby and dirty and boys, and they like burp <laughs> jokes and fart jokes, and we hang out and laugh and do stuff like that. But my daughter has me wrapped around her finger. Mm-hmm. It, it, period, the end. And it's neat because then the relationship that my wife has with the boys is very, very similar. It, it's funny how boys need their moms. Uh-huh. It is. It's true. You hear that all the time, but boys really need their moms. I'm 46 and uh, still communicate daily with my mother. I, I talk to my mom all the time, too. We yeah. were at my, my son had a soccer game last night, and my mom and dad went, and I hung out with them the entire evening. Like, it's just... The, the connection between a mom and a boy yeah, is undeniable. Just, yeah, uh, you You guys will laugh at this, but um, I remember being sick in college and my mom bringing me soup from two and a half hours away. Aww, and that's sweet. even after being married and working in a full-time job where I was working 10 and 12 hours a day, yeah. if it was so busy that I couldn't break away for lunch, yeah. I could pick up the phone. And I'm married. I'm 27, 20 years old. And I could go... <laughs> Mommy, Mommy. I'm, I'm hungry and I can't <laughs> leave work. She'd go, what do you want, you little... Dad? And she would drop <laughs> she whatever she's anyway. doing and bring me food. Mm. An, adult, I'm, I'm some, an adult getting my mom to bring That's me... That's great. Yeah. But it's good. At, at 46, if I call my mom right now, her knee-jerk response when she answers the phone is like, what do you need? 
<laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, um, because it's great. nine times out of 10, I need something. Yeah. You know, I need to pick up one of the girls or pick up something for me at the pharmacy. or. <laughs> and sometimes it's just to hear their voice. I mean, just... I like talking well, my, to my mom. My son called me yesterday, and he's like, hey, love you. Just wanted to say hi and just talk. That is just so rewarding. Oh my, my mom, gosh. still to this day, will just randomly text me, text me M-L-Y, and that's Mama Loves You. Oh, One of the things I catch, I catch a little flack that's for. That's so sweet. And I shouldn't catch flack for it because I'm being really responsible. But we were talking about, you know, I like to have a cocktail every now and then. But I don't want to drink and drive. Okay. Well, that's smart. My Very mature. Mother, <laughs> year, my mother years ago said, "If you're ever anywhere and you want me to come pick you up, I'll pick you up." <laughs> I use her all the time. So anytime that I'm out and I have a, even if I just have a couple, why risk it? Absolutely. I call mom. Yeah. Mom picks me up. I go back the next day. Today, and get my you car. mean now? I'm saying at age 46, uh-huh. if I go meet a friend wow. down at the hotel and have a couple cocktails, wow. rather than drive home, why risk it? Wow. I, I call mom, and that gives me a little time in the car with mom. And That's I, awesome. If I want to run through Taco Bell, we do that. Of course. She buys. <laughs> okay. That's one of the detrimental things about <laughs> drinking. It makes you eat. Sweetheart, would you like cinnamon twist with that order? <laughs> I know you love your cinnamon twist. Mom, it comes with the meal. Okay? You know. I'll get you extra. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know what's even better? I, I know you could Uber, but your mom probably really likes No, it's actually a good time. Color. You know, it actually gives us a moment to chat. Yeah. And, you know, maybe after a couple cocktails, I, I feel like telling her about some cool stuff. You know? <laughs> uh, well, no, we, well, we have a good hopefully time. Hopefully you limit the amount of cocktails so, you know, it doesn't turn into, you know... <laughs> Chris didn't even look at me. He's like, ah, I don't no, know. I mean, you know, we all are good at certain things. <laughs> yeah. I will t- I will say this about Wes. Um, I've known him for uh, 10 years now. 10 years. Right? 10 yeah. years, uh, June 25th. Wow. And not That's only awesome. have we, you know, we, we become very, very close friends, but I respect him immensely for yeah. his character, his hard work, and, you know, what he does inside of the communities Definitely. that he works inside of. But Wes is absolutely a riot to be around. Yeah. And he's he incredibly is. talented when it comes to entertaining people, and he is absolutely hysterical. He's probably the funniest person I've ever met in my life. And I just met him, <laughs> and he just makes you feel comfortable. Watching him tie his shoes is funny sometimes. Is it? it why? I just, I just, <laughs> just tie that way. his shoes? I, I do get winded. Uh, it's <laughs> Uh, that's part but, of it. But that's the point. Wes recently has gone on a journey of self-improvement and focusing on his health. Yeah. And oh. what, you're down 35? 37 pushing, pounds. Thir- pushing wow. 40 pounds. Yeah. And your blood pressure's dropping, your blood sugar's that's under control, awesome. and you're marching in the right direction. And It's important, it's awesome isn't to it? See. Yeah, I know it is. Um, and, you know, it really was him and, a, and another friend of ours that gave me a phone call and said, hey, we're worried about you. You wow. know, need you to Why? need you to be around. Well, like what, I was, what were the signs? I was, I was redlined on every health metric you could pretty much uh, have: um, blood pressure, um, sugar. Whoa. I mean, my weight. I mean, <laughs> everything was through the roof. Um, and um, you know, the, the speech that I got from him and a couple other friends of ours. Uh, they called me and said, uh, you know, you're not going to be around. I, one of our friends is a doctor. He said, I pronounce people like you all the time. Man, I'm a very high stress. Very high energy individual. Yeah. I can't imagine. So that. when you combine, <laughs> I'm also a bit of a workaholic. I'm so t- when you combine high stress workaholic with, I've known um, you for I don't know, <laughs> ten minutes. And as I I'm pounding that. through nitro cold brew, by the way. Yeah. But you chose the healthy choice with almond raw. Raw almond, almond milk. Yeah. No. But I mean, I sense that even when I met you, and so I think that you do have a responsibility to your family. And, well you know, you do. And to walk your daughters down the aisle. Sure. No, I, I you know, I have a responsibility to them and yes, um, to, to all yourself. the people that I'm involved with. It, it is funny how often uh, myself wasn't part of the issue. You know, I was right. really more concerned about letting him down or letting my family down or letting, wow. you know. I, I, my wife has to remind me all the time of certain things like that because that's that's part of, you know, the role inside of a family and being a, a man is um, – you want to go out and accomplish for others. You want to go mm. out and accomplish for the people you work with. You want to go out and accomplish for your family. You go out and do things with a directed purpose of building up, making that family unit more financially secure. That's our sure. job. So, mm-hmm. and being protector. Oh yeah. But I, but I think you know when we say men and women are different, you know there are studies showing <clears throat> that we are alike 
in some ways. And I sure. don't think I don't think that's wrong to say. Not of course all. not. Yeah. And I, but I do think that, you know, I have a lot of tendencies to be a workaholic and so does my husband as far as working hard, doing those things, taking risks. But at the end of the day, you know, he's a man and I'm a woman. Absolutely. And they're very, very different roles. They're very different roles. And I don't think that they're necessarily <laughs> roles that are defined by society as much as they are roles that are defined by biology. Well, and I also think what works in an individual marriage, like I am not the cook in the family. My husband is, and that's okay. Huh. Not wrong with that. Right? <laughs> I, I love to cook. I used to, I, I work a lot, but any, cha- any chance that I get, one of my favorite things to do on Saturdays is... I love smoking meats. I oh. absolutely love it. I love grilling, cooking out on the grill, smoking meats. One of my favorite things. Really? I love to cook. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 it's relaxing, isn't it? This is ad- yeah. It is, this has absolutely nothing to do with the podcast, but I might as well just since we're on the subject, talk about it. <laughs> I spent a year in Brazil after high school and did a Rotary Exchange scholarship. Wow. And went down to Brazil and wow. didn't know a soul, didn't speak the language at all, and there was a cooking show on. It was the only show in English, and it was translated in Portuguese. And so I would sit down and watch the show, and I would take notes and just you know write stuff down Man. and learned how to cook by default. So it's one of those things that I revert That's back crazy. to all the time um, just by you know sheer, you know, you learn. I learned about it. I watched it, but it became something that was so important to me because it's what connected me to communication and to culture. Mm. And so I, I picked up all this stuff by default. That's awesome. And still, there's times where there's you know stress and all kinds of things going on, and my wife and I'll just cook. Cooking is great. We just cook, yeah, yeah. And I don't get a chance to do it through the week, but in the week, you know, the weekends. We, it's just one of the things we do, and I absolutely love it. I like setting the table and making it nice, and then my husband cooks. He doesn't really like it that much anymore, but we do it. Eh. The kitchen island is the center of our household. The it's kitchen it. island this, is the for hub. the kids, it's the, the, the pets. My wife and I, we, a lot of dinners, people say, we well, need to sit around the table with your family. We have a great time whatever, standing up. Whatever we, works. We stand around and eat off the yeah, island. And whatever works. It may works. not be a plate. It might hey, be, I make some apps. You grab and, this and yeah, grab that. Eat a wing and then throw in some ribs. And whatever maybe works Maybe it'll be the out family. of sync. You know, we, yeah. That's, that's whatever, the way we do whatever it. Whatever it does. We I, eat that way a lot, too. I, I also like to smoke meats. When Chris and I are mm. together, if we are uh. cooking something together, it's like Neil deGrasse Tyson talking to like Enrico <laughs> Fermi about Uh-oh. physics or something, you know, and we're sitting there going, well, and Chris is going, well, now, once you smoke to this point, the collagen starts to break down inside of the- You do that, a good Chris oh. uh, <laughs> voice. Oh, I did. Wow. Don't get me started. I'm oh, blushing. my gosh. <laughs> You've been around him long enough, I guess. Uh, so What's your favorite smoked meat? Um, All like, of them. I'm well, on, I'll pick one. I'm on picanha right now. Uh, picanha is one of my favorites picanha. right now. Picanha. Picanha. Chris, what's the best way to describe that? Is it like a Brazilian? I've it is never a Brazilian cut that. of meat that's kind of like a top. It, it's a top sirloin. Um, mm. It's got a fat cap on it, but then it's leaner meat underneath it. Oh. And you slow cook it. Absolutely, you can slow cook it. You can slice it and sear it, but it is incredibly flavorful because that flavorful because that fat that fat cap just melts Seems into the food. Into and the way the Brazilians do their barbecue is, is they <laughs> only use rock salt and they cook over mm. wood charcoal. Oh, and that's you know Brazilian steakhouses. When you go to Brazilian steakhouses and you get you know they'll bring out picanha and slice it. It is just it is fantastic. It is a terrific cut of meat to barbecue. Wow. With. It, uh, so yeah, I I agree. That may be the absolute best one. So uh, interestingly enough, before we got on this, I'm a vegan. Nick, no <laughs> way. are you really? <laughs> are you really? I confess. I, I we can grill you confess. a good port. I can grill you a good portobello a, mushroom. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That'd I can grill you a good portobello. That'd be great. My husband is completely low carb on all kinds of meats right now. He lost about thirty pounds. Good for him because he had high blood pressure and he was like worried. So. But we just kind of now are in opposite. (laughs) Well, I could I could live my entire life eating just meat and fruit. I'd I'd be fine with that. I'd be happy. Eh, don't eat anything else. If I had to narrow it down, yeah. uh, And Jordan Peterson also just eats meat. He yes, he is he is a carnivore, and it's it's interesting watching what happens. I know. Um, I I am not a physician. We need to have some sort of disclosure on this, but there are there are. There's lots of anecdotal evidence of what 
just eating meat can do to solving autoimmune dis- disorders, autoimmune issues, um, hmm. digestive issues, wow. uh, mental issues. Um, they're seeing significant effects of ketogenic based diets and what it does to diminish the symptoms of, and I call them symptoms of autism, which is fascinating. Wow. Um, I I do strongly think that spikes in glucose are bad for you and fat is a fantastic source of energy to provide stabilized blood sugar over a long period of time. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not a doctor. I look at things and and read and research and, um, you know, I think we need to disclose that, but Mm -hmm. that, uh, human beings have been eating meat since we've been walking around the planet. Right. And I think that we are biologically, um, you know, adapted to getting a lot of nutrients from meat and meat-based products. I saw a um, documentary and now my husband actually told me about it and showed it to me. Now he's back on meat, but I'm, I have not <laughs> he gotten back on meat. I'm not a yeah. weird, like... I worship cows or anything. I've been to India where they have do they that. They do worship cows there. They yeah. do. It's weird. Mm-hmm. I was in the train station going to the Taj Mahal, and there was a cow standing next to me with earrings and a necklace on. It's beautiful. I cow. kid you not. The name's Bessie. She was a sweetheart. Well, it was weird, like really weird, in the train station. And then this little baby, this little girl, comes running up to me with a child that was starving, and then the guards wanted to, you know, pistol whip her. It's just weird. Oh, but anyway, oh, wow. but back to that, I don't, I'm not against it. I just can't make myself eat it anymore. I don't know. And you know what I like? I like freedom. Yeah. And, and whatever works Guess for you what? works for you, and whatever works for me works for me. Well, and that's mm, that. I don't know. That sounds postmodernistic. Ooh, let's dig Ooh. into that for a minute. Postmodernistic. <laughs> I would also further there argue is, there are absolute truths. There, well, there are. In other words, the comment you just made does not always work in society. What works for you is okay. What works for me is okay. I think freedom's pretty cool. Freedom's cool. And I'm not saying freedom's not cool. Freedom is cool. I would venture out to say But, that like, there are men and there are women. Of course. Okay. That's biologically factual. Okay. That is, you know, chromosomes and DNA. Um, I do think that we don't fully understand the um, human ability to absorb nutrients and create what is, quote, unquote, health. And I think it has to do with the bacteria in our guts and how it communicates with our brain hmm. and all of those things can be changed. Yeah. And what you fuel your body with is impacted by all that stuff. And that's why you that's see somebody true. that moves from a standard modern diet into a um, either a plant-based diet or a meat-based diet um, or, or any sort of shift like mm-hmm. that. And what happens is, is that the stomach distress is caused because you're killing off certain bacteria that then flushes out of your body. And the other bacteria that is more prone to eating and consuming what you're feeding your body with proliferates, and that's what creates a new homeostasis. And I, I think that certain people have different allergies, like I have an allergy toward milk and all that. I can't eat all that, so I think I have to tailor my diet to yeah, absolutely. no my wa- dairy at all. My wife can't eat gluten. She's, you know, she has um, what is called um, celiac, and yes. she had to do a particular test and a biopsy to determine if she had those markers or not. And right. Was, and it's just, we had to adapt, we well, had to adjust and adapt, and we There survived. we go. Yeah. Adjust and adapt. Pretty simple. Yes. So. What else, what else is interesting is, is that <laughs> she can handle small amounts of wheat outside of the United States where they do not have genetically modified wheat in their wow. diets like in Europe. What does that say? That's, uh, that's an interesting conversation. It is. And she also can handle sourdough, um, real sourdough, when it goes through the process of um, fermentation. Mm-hmm. And then- The real deal. Yeah. She, she can handle that in small doses. Well, so, you know, it's- eh. That says a lot it about does. our food supply. It does. It, it does. Really does. So Nikki, we've covered a whole breadth of information today. Yeah, we have. And what we haven't talked about were solutions. How do we move forward knowing that we have- lost a generation of kids to the opiate epidemic. We shut down a year of school systems. You you particular are on the ground level and dealing with a lot of these byproducts in the damage that has occurred 
to these young children. And, you know, God bless you for what you're doing in providing them with stability and education and a foundation and a home. But how do we move forward from here? What are the solutions that we're talking about when it comes to improving the lives of everybody, in, in, in particular the kids that um, have fallen victim to horrible, horrible things? I think uh, providing them with a template that they can hold on to that's real. I mean, what healing, inner healing and peace and how they can be empowered to change, that they don't have to live in that generational curse any longer. They can change and create, you know, one of the challenges too at the girls' home is the girls, some of the girls are afraid of success because success is a certain amount of responsibility, right? So I think formulating ways that they can have wins along the way, small wins that they can hold on to, that they will then like to have those wins, and then they're willing to take on greater responsibility, And I think that uh, showing them, you know, family uh, roles, and I want to go back to even what my husband and I do as far as crisis marriage uh, coaching, pretty much, is solution-based. We need to be solution-based. We need to hear what the problem is, but we cannot live in the problems of the past. We have to go forward and find solutions, real solutions that will solve the problems that each individual are they're dealing with. So whatever that looks like, we have to do. Now, hearing a child is important. Validating their abuse is important. A lot of family members do not want to admit that these things happened or they they went on. So a lot of people are walking around, they're not validated, they're not um, supported in any way. So they live with that trauma deep within themselves and they're screaming to get out. It's just screaming to get out. So that, that causes detriment in the marriage. It causes bad relationships. Because there's nowhere to put that angst. You know, you're just living in this torment. And I did for years and years and years until I just, you know, got set free from it. And, you know, the truth sets you free. I mean, you know, the truth totally sets you free. So validating is important. But then also providing these opportunities, I think, is very important. I mean, housing, the basic needs, and then education and all of the, this other, the other things that the girls can be successful at. Or children, adults, all walks of life. People want responsibility. You're also saying, though, that, that responsibility and those successes can also be a, a detriment or a way that they can self-sabotage. I think that it's hard because when you don't see success and you grow up in poverty, you grow up with hopelessness, then success, you can't really wrap your head around success. I think that I was different. I don't know. God must have made me with some kind of drive to overcome, but not everyone has that. And so you have to give reasons to succeed. You have to, you know, let people see that responsibility is good and let them taste and see that that is good and then really, really thrive on that. What you're telling me, though, is is that the most important foundation to all of this is the foundation of family. Yes, yes. And then it's learning how to develop the foundation of functional, successful family based on communication. Yes, And then it is a step-by-step process of moving people down the path of success Mm -hmm. through experiencing success a little bit at a time to then get towards the stability of what that is, which is being normal. Right. And and we see marriages, um, well, social media is one. Adultery is very high. Um, We're seeing the breakdown of communication is the biggest thing that we see. Um, So, you know, dealing with the girls, the girls need to learn how to communicate. They don't know how, but also adults in general, you know, to to stop divorce, there's little tiny fixes that people can do that, that really work. I mean, I have a simple communication tool that I share and when couples follow that, that it revolutionizes their whole marriage their whole relationship, teaching the girls how to communicate. 
this is what I need and this is what I want and doing it in a calm, gentle way. There's something to be said for the irony in that what you're talking about is the key is improved communication and yet we use social media as a thing that's a detriment. It is. This thing that's built precisely for communication. <laughs> the internet itself is built 100% well, for communication, and yet it seems we're communicating worse and worse every day. Well, and I we see it every day, couples falling into adultery and into uh, pornography. Uh, you have all these images that are available to young men on a daily basis uh, and young women. You see, you know, the Facebook and all this uh, social media is a big detriment because you have literally, you know, people longing for what they're not getting at home. So then that you have a, a third voice that's speaking to you and you think that's going to be better. And then you leave everything that's supposed to be good for something that's awful. Well, then think about a young, a young male, a young man mm -hmm. no longer has to learn to go up and have interpersonal communication right. with the person they're interested yeah. in. Um, they don't have to, they can swipe left, swipe right. They can mm -hmm. order a mate like pizza. Yeah. And then of course, like you bring up porn. I mean, right. essentially you know, you, you have all these, you're going to have a whole entire generation of men that have no idea how to how to court someone. Right. And uh, I, nor do they have to. And, no. and, and what are these women, what are these women out there dealing with right now as well? Right. And, oh, and I'm not blaming slim, women, yeah. certainly. No, but it's you know. slim pickings for women. Well, it, it, and, and they're sitting around going, where are all the good men? Well, they're, they're all at the house. Swiping well, right. Swiping right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that we have... Uh, we have people trying to stand up and teach boys and men the right way um, to be fighters, to be, you know, like you mentioned, go out and get some game outside and bring it to the home. You know, man up, that type of thing, I think is important to be the man, do the role. It sounds like we're moving into tradition. a time. Tradition, yes. tradition. Yeah, yeah, but tradition. it sounds like we're moving into a time where education is taking on um, – a different form yeah. in what we need to be providing to kids at a young age, which isn't just arithmetic and grammar, but it's also tangible real life skills to know how to deal with the world that they're moving into. And back to even the girls home, you know, we have to have sex trafficking education for the girls to be able to tell a groomer or someone that's trying to, we have to have that because they're vulnerable. So I that mean, they're it, aware of manipulation. Yes. Let me ask you a, a very direct question. Understanding the damage that occurs from sex trafficking of young people in particular, not only just adults, but in general, that's awful, but of the young people, I, I'm of the opinion that pedophiles should be executed. I don't think that they provide any benefit to society. And if you look at the damage that they do, that they do to the developing the development of the pathways in the brain of the youth, of the young people that they are sexually harming, it is detrimental and almost not reversible. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that pedophiles should probably be executed. Well, and the science shows that pedophiles don't get better with age. You know, a pedophile at age 25 doesn't outgrow it by the time they're age 50. Yeah. That's the science says that's the case. They, yeah. they don't right. get they don't get better. They don't get better. They don't I mean that's what it shows even when I did um, my thesis on domestic violence these boys that were in domestic violence by their fathers 80% of them went on to abuse their their wives. So I mean someone does have to reach the pedophiles. I mean it's not going to be me. I I hate to even even those words uttered out of my mouth, but the, but still, I mean, there has to be a remedy. I mean, in my life, God is was my remedy. Is my remedy. There has to be compassionate people. There has to be. Yeah, and if we because you can't annihilate them all, you're not going to be able to um, execute them all. If God, we're all. God did make everyone with a gift, a good gift. If we're honestly discussing it, though, this is where the conundrum for me um, g starts, is yeah. because. It's pragmatism versus compassion. Yeah, they, they, those right. those pedophiles right. are probably a victim themselves of that same thing. They are. And that's what's developed into that particular behavior. Mm -hmm. And so while on one side, um, you know, having a daughter and two 
to boys, I feel very, very strongly about that. That would mm-hmm. be the, 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 you know, the rage inside of me. Yeah. The other side of it is, is that I understand completely that that is started from somewhere. Yes. And it is probably not a natural behavior no. in some way, shape or form. Right. So, you know, what do we do there? Right. Well, we have to have real programs that change people. Um, and it's demonic and evil in nature. I mean, you look at the pedophiles, you look at the the damage it does for generations. I mean, even, you, even even convincing a parent to let them take money to have sex with a fourteen year old girl is still pedophilia. In it my is. Mind. It is of that parent. And there there are there are. Th- that is a direct intent of an action mm-hmm. that... I- well, I think that the, the desire for drugs, when you look at a drug addict, and I'm not an expert in drugs or drug addicts. I just know the aftermath of drugs. I, I see it every day. I'm not an expert in it. However, I've seen it where your desire for the drug will overtake anything. So a child so, molester is doing it for sexual gratification. The drug addict is doing it for the gratification. I don't think a molester does well, it for, for sexual. Well, there's power. There's, there's power. There's power. But it's, it's all about power. Sure, It's sure. all about power and control. It's all about power and control. But that's their. That's what they're getting from it. Right. That's why it's secretive. And so as soon as power and control is broken is one of the dangerous parts in the victim's life. But you, you have to break that power cycle. There's an Cycle underlying control. theme here, though, that I think we really need to touch on All right. before we wrap up. Okay. And, and, and it, it, I think something that really needs expressed is the, the foundation for you that led to mm-hmm. your improvement of your marriage, your improvement mm-hmm. of your communication, um, your dedication to service mm-hmm. to others and to the community. It all started in an end. It all starts and ends with your relationship with God. Yes. And I think that needs discussed before we go. Yes. Uh, I was at a point in my life where I was very desperate and I was, quite frankly, headed for divorce. And it was of my own doing, although my husband was in doing wrong things, I was saw myself in that to where I would sabotage my marriage. Um, But all of my abuse and neglect just came to a pinnacle. And I just cried out to God. I cried out and I said, you know, I said, Jesus, save me. And I felt his presence. And I started, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And you were not a religious person at the time. No, I never went to church. Like, as a matter of fact, I was seeking and I went to a certain denomination where, and I won't mention the denomination, but you'd have to go into the priest and confess your sins. And then the priest started telling me his problems. And I said, this isn't. I don't want to know their problems. Like, I don't have enough. I don't. This is wrong. So uh, it was in the desperation cry for God that I felt his presence. And I started finding out about God. I learned how to pray. I didn't know anything about the Bible. And I started reading the Bible and I got hungrier and hungrier for truth. So the more I read the Bible, the hungrier I got to, for my spirit to get filled. And I started learning how to do do these things, how to, how, to, how to have a relationship with God, I never knew I could. And that relationship with God truly led me to life So and peace and deliverance of, let's say, the demons that were haunting me. Let's say the, the good of goodness of God and his forgiveness and grace, me accepting that just... And the process of him delivering me from all this poison that has been in my life has enabled me to serve and give love unconditionally because God is an unconditional lover. This has been a fantastic episode of West Virginia Right Now. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that you. you came here and how touched I am to hear your story. Um, you inspire me and your actions and your honesty and communication inspire me. And I will tell you right now that the city of Huntington, the city of Canova, the area itself is a better place because of you and your actions. And I think everybody out there needs to know that. Wow. You're an inspiration to a lot of people. You affect the lives of so many young women 
that have not been given a shot in hell and you step in and give them a chance. And that is incredibly noble of you. And from me and my family and everybody else in the community, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. You're a gift. Wow. Thank you. Very humbled. Once again, this has been West Virginia Right Now. I'm Chris Miller along with Wes Thompson. We thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the story of our guest, Nikki Thomas. Thank you.